the last block here uh, of the this year's J Focus, and uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Lawrence Blankens. Thank you. I would like to take you all back to the year 1991. I was in nine at the time, and just during the summer holiday, it was a nice summer. So uh, we were having a, a family holiday by car. So uh, imagine my family driving the car, me sitting behind the driver's seat, parents in front, my siblings to my right, the back full of luggage, toys, books, and driving along these very nice roads. And uh, you can imagine that at some point you might encounter a tanker truck like this one. It takes a bit of time before you can get past it, so you need to overtake it. You need to overtake it. So um, once you overtake it, you might notice that there's a little sign, there's a sign on this tanker truck, like this sign. And I was wondering, what does this sign mean? Maybe you know, at that time, I didn't know. So, how would you go about figuring that out? Well, this is 1991, so the World Wide Web exists. Unfortunately, only at CERN, it will take until the autumn until it has spread to other uh, academia, other universities in the world. But then again, it will take another, probably another four years before there's dial-up connections. And it will take another seven years before mobile phones become really commonplace, at least here in Sweden. The rest of the world took a bit longer. And even then, even if you had a mobile phone, the best thing you could do is probably play snake on it. So, what do you do? Well, I'll tell you what I did. So maybe a bit about me. My name is Lars Barkers. I'm a consultant at Group 9. Well, consultant is a really generic term. Um, in my case, I work with clients that have uh, issues with complexity, and I help them solve it by programming Java and by telling a story. So back to the sign. What did I do? Well. While on the road, while on holiday, there was nothing much I could do, at least not much I could think of. So what did I do? When I came back home, I went to the library, looking if I could find information about this. For the younger people here, this is what a library used to look like. Um, but unfortunately, at least my local library didn't have any books explaining this, and I actually didn't even know what to look for. So. At some point, I came across a magazine, newspaper, that actually had a ta explains what it was and had a little table in there explaining at least some of the numbers. So what I did is I copied that, not like this, because this is 1991, but actually like the old-fashioned way, copied it. Or if I came across something that I could just cut out, I would cut and paste it with a glue stick. So, and... Um, so, so what I was doing, I was gathering information, so hopefully I'm putting it in a notebook, so hopefully next time I was on holiday or came across a truck like this, I would actually be able to look it up and figure out what the sign meant. The truck was scary. So, and actually I started collecting more data, more tables, more information, because, well, you never know what you're going to need, right? You couldn't look it up, so I was actually hoarding like these kind of information, just, just in case you needed it. Because back then, no internet, so if you wanted to know it, you needed to have it with you in a notebook or somehow. So that's how I started out with data hoarding. By the way, in case you're wondering, this is like a UN danger sign. So the, the 30 at the top means it's a flammable liquid. The three means that it's combustible at room temperature. So that's really important for the fire department to know if there's a crash. And the 1203 means that it's gasoline. So this is information that's really useful if the truck broke down or crashes for the fire department to know what's going on. Um, so what would happen? So over the years, I collected more data. So what would have happened if I would taken this like to the, the world-class level of hoarding this kind of data? Well. Of course, there's a subreddit for data hoarding, because there's a subreddit for everything. Um, and they had uh, like a poll, like who has the biggest collection? This is for self-reported data, so there's no proof. 
And the biggest collection someone had was 12 petabytes. So in case you're wondering, this is the SI table. So a petabyte is a thousand-ish terabyte. A terabyte is a gigabyte. So that's like 12,000 terabytes, 12 million gigabytes of data. That's a lot. So 12 petabytes. And this is mostly offline storage. So no cloud storage, but somehow this person managed to have it locally. So what does that actually look like, 12 petabytes of data? Because when I read this at first, I couldn't imagine it. So look at how do you store this? Well, you can store this on magnetic tape, these backup tapes, like this one, nowadays the green. This holds approximately 12 gigabytes of data. So, sorry, 12 terabytes of data. So I would need about a thousand of these tapes. So what does it actually look like? Well, banana for scale, not really going to work. So let's go to the universal uh, way of expressing scale, which is of course IKEA moving boxes. <laughs> um, so an IKEA moving box, I think you can fit about 200 of these tapes in a moving box. So you need five boxes. These are all large boxes. Uh, the boxes cost like two euros, 20 kroners a piece. So for 10 euros, 100 kroners, you're done with the boxes. That's just the boxes though. The tapes each cost 60 euros or 600 kroners. So for a thousand tapes, that's 60,000 euros or 600,000 kroners. That's quite a lot of money. And then you only have it offline. I mean, these tapes, they come with barcodes, so you can them. But you need to find them if you want to have the information, have some indexing system. So that's not really ideal, at least not for my purposes. I would like to have it online. So what would that, well, for that, I would need something like this. This is like a, uh, this holds about 60 hard drives. So if I take about 60 hard drives, 16 terabyte each, I'm almost up to one, pet, one petabyte. This thing, the enclosure uh, with the hard drives, costs about 60,000 uh, euros, 600,000 kroners for one terabyte, for one petabyte. So I would need 12 of these. Now, you can actually get secondhand drives and get expansion units. So it might be a bit cheaper than, uh, what is it, 7.2 million kroners, but you get the idea. This, actually having this amount of data can get quite expensive if you do it as a person. So, and I don't know about electricity prices here, but I read they're also quite high. So this is an electricity meter, uh, old fashioned style. So a hard drive takes about five watts of power when it's not doing anything. That's also something you can read in the data order Reddit. Uh, also, which hard drives take the least power. So you need about 720 disks, five watts each, doing nothing. Uh, I don't know what your energy bill is like last couple of months, but uh, this would be just paying for the energy would be really a hassle. So, yeah. So I mentioned data hoarding. I actually didn't know the term. I learned about this from a, a presentation at a local event um, where the presenter explained that this can actually be a problem. I mean, imagine spending this amount of money on, well, a hobby compulsion. Um, so, and she explained that it was really uh, problematic for her. She was taking actions to, um, to, uh, to solve this. And it's actually very brave of her to be there. To, to, because she wanted to share that this, this you know, might have seen on discovery, like hoarding, people just collecting all kinds of stuff in their house. This can also happen digitally, <laughs> it's data hoarding. It can grow to a similar extent. My personal data hoard size, all data together is 18 terabytes. So that fits on the hard disk, the largest ones you can buy nowadays. So I don't think I have a problem, but that's true for most data hoarders. They don't think they have a problem. Um, however, if you or someone you know does this sort of thing, that's of course nice. However, if it gets them into like financial or social trouble or causes anxiety, please get them to look up a general petition, a family doctor and get them to get some help because this can actually be um, a real psychological problem. Um, fortunately, if you, do every, if you do it professionally, then of course it's all of a sudden okay. So, I moved on to do this professionally. In case you were wondering, like, hey, the petabyte is there. We're almost at the top. Don't worry. The SI conference uh, last December added two more. So we can have to go up to a quetabyte, quetabyte 
uh, uh, before we actually run out of numbers. Uh, so still some room to grow. So, uh, so I mentioned I do this professionally now. So I basically see, and then, then it's okay. So basically, as a data hoarder, professionally or personally, you want to store everything. No snapshots, no data warehousing, you just want to store everything. So why would you want to do that professionally? Well, I broadly see three areas where you want to do this. Collecting personal information about people. Well, if you're doing that, or your company's making it their business, then you might have heard about this thing called the GDPR, some of your privacy regulations. You might want to find another um, business, because unless you're actually asking people to opt in, and allow them to opt out at any time and do all kinds of things, then this is really either already illegal or it will be in a couple of years. So what's the other one? The second one is actually collecting things about, uh, collecting data about things. So for example, racing cars, they have lots of sensors, they collect terabytes per, per race actually of data. Uh, trains are also rather uh, complex machines nowadays with lots and lots of sensors, so you can collect about that as well. Likewise, robotics, and of course, uh, power stations, in this case, nuclear power stations, also have lots of sensors, lots of data. And what do companies do with this? They analyze this data and they create something called a digital twin. So a digital representation of a physical object that they can use for simulations to determine if maintenance is needed and stuff like that. Unfortunately, most companies don't really share what they're doing. Uh, racing racing uh, Formula One companies are very tight-lipped about this. They just say we take terabytes of data, and that's basically what they say. Um, but this is, I think, a really interesting subject. So I know that at least three of the four on the screen are actually made and designed here in Sweden, uh, maybe even four. Um, so if you're working for a company and you can convince them to share, that's something with competitors and stuff, then please consider submitting a talk. Just uh, I think, and I, I'm sure pr many other people think, that this is actually a pretty interesting subject, like collecting data, digital twins, about, about things. About, and, uh, and you might think trains are boring, but trains can be really complex, interesting um, uh, machines, actually, that you can learn from it. Um, so that's the second one. What's the third one? That's because you're required by law to keep the data. So we've heard examples on the conference about banks, uh, required to keep data, government, uh, uh, medical facilities, insurance companies. And they're required by law to keep basically everything they have, be able to reproduce it for seven years, 20 years, 70 years, whatever. It, it depends on the data on the country and the law, but in generally very long time and you need to actually keep it. So this is the area where, well, where the clients I work for work in. They need to actually by law store everything they do. So, what does that look like? Well, let's take a very simple web shop as an example. So, let's say this is the order table. So, customer X put two or in two orders to two, two different addresses. So, did they first live at one address and move to the other? Did they send a gift to the first and the second? And if they moved, when did they actually move? So, from a GDPR compliance standpoint, this is probably as much information you should gather. But from a data hoarder standpoint, this is like, I'm missing information. So, if you would look in the, uh, the, the, the address registration that the government keeps, what, would, what might it look like for person X? Well, it might look like this. So, uh, well, starting in 2013, and then moved in, in uh, the 1st of July 2022. Notice that uh, they actually shipped something to the address they moved to before they actually started living there officially, because of course you can do that. Um, but this is, this is like the view you have as a government. You want to know when things actually happen. And that has all kinds of reasons, tax reasons. You need to pay taxes if you move to a especially big place like that one. Um, so, and I think I'm presenting this as a relational table, which you can store this in any kind of data store. But I'm, I'm taking relational now here because most of things also apply here to NoSQL, uh, like Mongo kind of solutions. So, um, 
And if you ever uh, read a uh, database design course, you'll have heard about normalization. It's basically there's a number of steps you can take, up to six, I think, maybe even more nowadays, in which you basically uh, redu uh, remove all duplication. Because duplication is bad, it's inconsistency and stuff. Unfortunately, what they don't teach you is that once you normalize, you want to denormalize a bit for performance reasons. Because imagine finding where this person lived uh, on the 28th of February 2019. Writing a, a SQL query for this is rather uh, challenging, unless you actually duplicate a bit of data, denormalize, and add an end date table. So you can fill the end date table with, well, in this case, null means infinite, they still live there. This is actually nice to query. So if you're working with these things, just as an aside, I think normalization is excellent, but denormalization, even in relational databases, is really necessary if you want to get proper performance. Because storing the data is one thing, but usually you don't want to spend like a week to actually find it again. Usually you want even historical data, you might want to find, well, within two seconds. Um, so denormalization is uh, key. So, looking at this, so person, this gives a bit of history about person X. Um, well, you've designed this software, everything is good. And then you get a uh, support is calling you because you have, a, you have an angry customer. Uh, because actually, there were uh, two, two customers, two banks, that asked, like, where, where is person X living? And they both uh, called after person X had moved. Um, but one bank was told the old address and the other bank was told the new address. How is that possible? And, and they, they needed to transfer some money, so they figured out they, they found some problem there. So, well, what's the problem here? Well, hopefully you have proper logging of what you did when you did it. And as it turns out, um, they asked on different days. So they all asked after the person had moved, but on different days. Because the first thing you obviously do when you move is inform everyone that you have moved, right? The very first thing you do, one past midnight, once you've got a new house, new place, is inform everyone you move. Well, most people wait a bit. So you wait. Um, so what actually happened in this case is that this person, um, uh, uh, so was living there, actually only informed the government on the 5th. That, uh, that they moved. Um, so they, they stopped living at the old place, started living in a new one. Um, and what actually happened was that uh, the first bank called on the 2nd of Ju uh, July. So they still got the old information because, well, at that time we didn't know anything else. The, 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 uh, the person X hadn't informed us yet that they had moved because they were still unpacking probably. Uh, the second bank called after uh, on the 7th of July, and they got the new information. So when you do something like this, you want to, you not only need to register when something started, but also when you knew about it. Because usually uh, when something happens, I refer to this material time, material time is when something actually happens. So this person moved on the 1st of July. But didn't register that, so formally didn't announce it until the, what was it, the 7th or the 5th, the 5th. And this is actually, um, this is actually important uh, because, well, if you want to reproduce this, so this explains why one of the banks was told one thing and the other one was told the same thing. Well, they asked the same question. They asked, where does this person, where does this person X live on the 1st of July? But because they asked at different times, one before, another one after the move was registered, they got different answers. So when you have a database like this, uh, you don't specify like what happened to person X on the 1st of July. You tell them like, okay, what happened to person X on the 1st of July? That was registered on the 1st of August. So you actually need to specify both X's when you query a system like this. When did it actually happen and when did, at what point in time do you know about it? Because if the banks would have asked, like, um, where did person X live on the 1st of July as registered on the 1st of July, 
they would have both gotten the same answer, being the old address. So when you have a system like this, you actually need to specify two dates, when it actually happened, and then what date you're, you're basically you're querying the database. Um, and then you get the, the center line is basically where material time and formal time are the same. So the time that it actually happened is the same as the time it was registered, which is rather unusual. So usually uh, we're somewhere uh, at the top here. So usually you register something after it has happened. You move, you inform the government of, or, or whomever that you moved afterwards. Um, you can also uh, inform them uh, before. I am going to move at the 1st of March. You might want to register that. Actually, this system I'm presenting here supports that. But then you get things like, I, a month ago I told you I was moving last week, but actually I didn't, and I'm moving next week, but to a different address. So you might want to store that, or not, depending on your case. So most of the time, uh, when you only store, uh, most organizations I know only store things uh, like retrospectively, so after they have happened. Because um, it works if you can do things in the future as well, but all your business rules need to be aware of that things can happen in the future and that things that you thought were going to happen in the future didn't actually happen in the future. It gets really kind of inception-ish. So if you must do that, it's possible, but if you can avoid it, by, for example, if people say uh, have an address change in the future, queue it up in some kind of system, release it once the date is actually reached, that makes life a lot easier. Um, so, back to the example. So, this person moved, well, actually told uh, the government, uh, the organization that they moved on the 5th, but they actually made a mistake. They didn't move to number one, they moved to, moved to number three. Um, so, how would he register that? We can't change anything in this database because, well, then we change history and we need to keep history because of government and rules and regulations. So the only thing we can do is basically add another line, insert another line. So what you'll see here, this is basically an append-only database. The only thing you do is insert new data, sometimes maybe filling a field, field as null, but never actually changing anything. Because if you change anything, you lose data. So you need to design your database in such a way that you can do everything by just inserting. So what can you do here? Okay, it was so, we'll first register that... Uh, the person lived on the, uh, number one from the first till the first, so basically zero days. So this is a way of, of uh, showing that they actually didn't live there. And then we registered their correct address. Um, on the ninth, they registered that their actual address as of the first of July is number three. So that's good, um, except that depending on what you do, your government might require you to register uh, to, to register within a certain time, let's say seven days. So in this case, the person, the registration date is the nine, so that's past the seven days, so they might get a fine. That's a thing, but you can imagine that that can be a thing. So, um, but did they actually do it too late? So that's the, um, that's the question, because what could have happened is that they actually sent in the correction on time, but your system was having some downtime, and it only processed it two weeks later. So I showed you this picture, material time, that's when something happens, but formal time, there might actually be multiple access there. You need to record when something was entered into your system, always, but it might be that this person mailed in a, a letter, a form by, by post. So you might also need to register the time that you received the letter or scanned it. Or if it's a registered letter, um, you, might, you might have the time that they, they, they handed it in at, at, the, post, at, at the post counter in the, in the supermarket. So, and actually, depending on use case, you might actually have to register multiple ones, multiple formal times that something happened. The time that someone handed in uh, the, the, the letter with the post, the time that you received it, and the time you entered it into the system. Ideally, that's all the same time, but in practice, there can be quite a bit of time in between. And depending on your use case, you might actually have multiple formal times 
in your database. You always need the one like when it was actually put in my database, but you might have the need to have more than that. And this gets especially interesting if you have like a local, uh, regional, and national government, and the information first gets to the local level, then gets moved to the regional level, and then moves up to the uh, national level, and that might not that might take a couple of days. So at the regional level, you might know about something a couple of days earlier than is known at the national level. And yes, this for governments, this can be important. Uh, somewhere else where this is important, all our, our favorite topic is patents. If you follow a patent, the first one wins. So it's the time of filing the patent that matters. And then you can file a patent in Sweden at a different time than you file it in France, than you file it in the US or in Japan. So this actually matters. Some, you can have, some patents can have like dozens of registration times for different regions, for different levels. Um, fortunately, it's usually just a bit smaller than that. So, formal time, material time, you need to get some time to wrap your head around that, but that's usually quite okay. Um, so, let's see. Um, at least in a perfect world it would be. Because, I don't know about you, but, but I make mistakes. I mean, we're all people, computers don't make mistakes, but the people that program them do. And as a person, when I'm doing something, I make mistakes. So maybe in this case, the person actually told, the, told us he was move, living at number three, but the pe person entering the data, maybe on the phone, actually entered the wrong number. Well, we could do the same thing as we did before, uh, correct it on the mind, but then the person would have to pay a fine, which isn't fair because it's not his or her fault, their fault. It's the person that was registering its fault, they made a mistake. Mistakes are humans, so how do you handle that? Well, so you need to have a way to correct that. So, you, well, the only thing you can do, like I said, is add extra data. So you add the data, like you did before, it's number three, but you mark it as a correction. And you include a pointer to the previous record. So I can't change the record anymore, but I can point like this record was changed. And if you're in a relational database, you can actually have a field that you flip to true, uh, indicating, hey, something special happened. Just for optimization purposes, it's nice. Um, so you need to, a correction, you need to store like this, because what happens if, if, if the government asks like, hey, uh, where does this person live? Well, then that's uh, uh, well, number three. When was it registered? You don't show this number, this was, it was actually registered on the ninth. It's a correction, so you follow the link and you show the fifth. So on the official form, you don't print this was registered at the ninth, which it was. You print it was registered on the fifth, because that's when the customer actually, or the, 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 the citizen person X, uh, actually filed the data. And that's what he should be, um, so he shouldn't be fined because you or, or someone in the, in the organization made a mistake. But you need to be able to register that. So what's usually done here is that you print a registration date, official registration date, the 5th, and then have a little asterisk there which says, hey, but actually we registered it on the 9th. This kind of official thing, when you deal with, with these kind of government things, you need to do this. So actually, I said formal and material time, there's also corrected time. So when you're, doing a, when you're asking about this system, you say, okay, what's the situation on the 1st of July, as registered on the 1st of August, with corrections up to the end of the year. Usually you, you, well, you can only correct after it's formally registered, so it's basically two and a half dimension. This is the kind of thing you need to ask a system like this. So you need to specify when did it actually happen, when was it registered, and to what point do I want to include corrections or fixes. Um, because this can all be afforded. I mean, no, no, um, I need to file, file my taxes before the 1st of May. Um, because otherwise you get a fine. Um, but yeah, so if the system is down and I submitted it to the front end system, so they need to know when it actually happened. And if they made a mistake, if I made a mistake, it's on me, right? But if they made a mistake, they need to correct it, even if it's after the 1st of May. And I shouldn't be blamed for that. Um, and so, unfortunately, 
This is not the only kind of mistake people can make. Because um, this is actually what happened to me uh, when I was um, moving out to a student apartment in the early 2000s. Um, a sort of a weird apartment. It didn't inc include electricity. So I had to uh, apply for my own electricity uh, subscription, uh, the electricity company. So well, this is 2000s, uh, 2003, I think. So I went online and filled out the form, right? Where are you going to live? Where are you living now? What kind of connection? Blah, blah, blah. What's your, what's your account number? How do you want to pay? Actually, and it was in the fine print, but I didn't read that. Uh, at that time, they, you could only use the online form if you were moving, not if you had a new registration. So instead of uh, connecting me, they actually moved my parents, where I used to live, to the student department. <laughs> and to this day, parents still have the same energy provider. If you ask them, my parents lived for one day in the student department, which was like a little studio, which doesn't really fit. Um, which, well, can still be problematic if you say, yeah, we have a discount for people that have been uh, with us for 10 years. My parents wouldn't qualify with the way it was registered in the system, but they should. So this situation, let's say that we accidentally moved person X. They actually didn't move at all. But well, we registered it, so what are we going to do? So we might want to mark these two records like stop living at 68 and move to number one as something special. And we need to add a line because, again, that's the only thing we can do. We cannot change any data, we can just add. So we need to add it with the old information, mark it as a, re re a restoration record, so we're restoring a previous state, basically git, revert, that kind of thing, undoing, and point to uh, the original record because we need to keep the registration time for that. So, um, this sort of thing um, can happen. So people can make mistakes, they can enter the wrong data, but they can actually also uh, enter the correct data for the wrong person. And if you don't have a way of managing this, and this is the government, so you just can't go into the database. There are companies that go into the database, have someone go into the database, just run an update statement and fix it like that. But unfortunately, if you already told the tax office, like, hey, this person moved, then the tax office is going to complain if you just update your database, like you told us something and now you're telling us something different, what happened? So you can't do that. You need to make it explicit that you made a mistake and undid it in this case. So it's, it, it's well, for us developers, it's, it's quite common. If you look at Git, basically that's a pent only also right. You cannot actually change it. Well, you shouldn't be able to change a <laughs> commit once you've done it. There's of course the force and well, uh, try not to do that. Try not to rewrite history. And you get into trouble like here. So you actually uh, want to uh, record, explicitly record that you restored the old record. And then again, uh, if you print out something, then you want to follow the pointer up to there, say, hey, the, the actual registration time is 2013. So if I have a 10-year uh, uh, old customers that have been, me have been with us for 10 years get a discount, then this person, person X would qualify should qualify because it's not their fault that someone made a problem and it shouldn't be their problem. Uh, unfortunately, with lots of businesses, it is. Governments, at least nowadays, try to not make their mistakes. To, well, well, it doesn't always work, but at least the, the, the aim is to not make their mistakes the problem of the people, of the citizens. Um, and um, yes, you can correct a correction. Yes, you can revert, you, uh, restore and revert a correction. Yes, you can correct a reversion. Yes, this can stack. So recursively, this can apply. Because you make a, can make a correction. And actually, you can also need to make corrections in the past. So we thought this person lived at 68. He mo uh, they moved. But they actually lived at 69. And now we want to correct it because to keep our records updated. So this actually stacks. So if you do this sort of thing, your system, this system, if you implement it correctly, actually needs to work with that. Uh, because let's take this to the max. And this is an example based on actual something that happened near where I live. This is a primary school. Actually, the building on the left is a primary school. 
On the right is the, is the house. It's actually the headmaster's house. So they used to, uh, at least in the Netherlands, they used to build schools in, in villages. They built a school. They also built the house for the headmaster, so that they, they had somewhere to live with their family. Um, you see it in the, in, in the city center. It, it's in the village center, church in the background. That's at least in the Netherlands how we used to build schools. So let's say this was an old school. This one still exists. But let's say the school was demolished. demolished. Um, the, the, the land it was stood on was sold to the local government. And the non-profit that was running the school was, was disbanded, basically. Let's say that all happened 30 years ago. Um, now I have a company and I want to start a new school here. Uh, so I want to make some profit running a school. So I would like to buy this land from the from municipality, from the local government, so I can build a school there. So I start the whole process. And look at the land range. It turns out that there's actually two pieces of land. There was the land which the school was built on, the land the house was built on. The land the school was built on was transferred to the local government. The land the house was built on was not. So technically it's still owned by the non-profit, a non-profit that hasn't existed for 30 years. Now, of course, you should not be able to disband a non-profit or any organization when they still have assets. But again, people make mistakes. This kind of thing happens. So what did you do? Well, you can go into the database and change it. Uh, I, and, and I guess that might happen somewhere. And to this, I'm not a lawyer, so don't, don't, no, don't ask me about the details. But what happens in the Netherlands is, you go to a judge, and the judge says, hmm, that's a problem, we should do something about that. Uh, and the judge will order the government to uh, undo the, 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 the disbanding of the non-profit. So 30 years ago, the non-profit was disbanded, it was cancelled. Uh, and now the judge says, yeah, but whatever happened, the judge is actually ac actively rewriting history. Whatever what happened 30 years ago just didn't happen. Uh, then the judge will do appoint a board for the non-profit. The board will make a deal, sell, sell off the, the, the little piece of land that the headmaster's house was sitting on. And then we go back to the judge and the judge says, hmm, you know, you know I told you to, the, to basically undo what you did 30 years ago. Now I'm telling you to redo it again, as of 30 years ago. So I want you to restore it, because otherwise this nonprofit would have to pay uh, taxes for 30 years. So I'm actually going back to the way it was. So this doesn't happen a lot, about a dozen times in the Netherlands every year. But that's enough that if you design a system, you actually need to deal with that. So you need to deal with people making mistakes, 30, way, uh, 30 years, 70 years. I mean, the oldest companies in the Netherlands are 500 years old. Uh, they manage water infrastructure. It's, uh, you can find YouTube videos on it. Um, and there's also some, uh, some, some, some uh, churches that are actually like a couple of hundred years old. And they're registered as organizations, non-profits usually. Um, so, and according to the law, the judge can just retroactively say, Okay, whatever happened 200 years ago, it just didn't. And then a month later, it did. This is not something you would like as a software developer, I guess. Um, but this is, this is what happens. At least, I don't know here in Sweden or in the rest of the world, but this is what happens in the Netherlands, like yeah, a dozen times a year. So your system needs to deal with it. So then you need to do the whole... Uh, a correction, rest restoration, and then the whole stacking it, you actually need to make sure that this works well. Fortunately, it's always retrospective, so always back in the past, but you need to make sure that this works well. I've shown a very simplified version, but this is basically the essence of how this system works. So with just an append-only database with pointers back, you can imagine that if you have lots of changes, actually getting a performance query is actually challenging because you might need to scan through all the records, like line by line, and figure out what happens. And writing some SQL for that is, well, <laughs> it, it can get challenging. It can get very challenging. Uh, but for me, that's where the fun is. I like complexity. I like reducing it. And I like, obviously, like telling about it. And hopefully, uh, uh, transfer some of that here. 
So, um, what I'd like to, you to take away from this is there's the material timeline, and uh, that's, so that's when something actually happened. There's the formal timeline, that's when it was registered. You can have multiple formal times. So. Um, and these are different things. Might not be in your system, but mean in reality, unless you have a system that within a second, and that's okay for you, uh, registers whatever happens in the real world, you have this situation, whether you model it in your system or not. Uh, and if you want to do, be a proper data hoarder, professional data hoarder, you need to model this. You need to somehow store this. And not in a data warehouse of taking snapshots every week. We need every change, even if the 10 changes happen in a second, every change needs to be recorded because government laws, well, you get the really uh, interesting discussions with regulators if you don't do this. Interesting in the sense that you don't want to have those kind of discussions. Um, they're not fun. I mentioned corrected time. Yes, it also happens because people make mistakes. Um, uh, but if you start with this uh, material formal time and then later add the corrected time, or well, think about how you do it. It might, might be different for your domain. At least next time that you query a database or ask someone to do that, think about what am I actually asking. Am I asking about material time? Do you include the formal time, the registration time? Is there anything with corrections? Am I interested in that? And up to what point? So that's what I'd like to leave with you. This was my, this was the uh, presentation. Are there any questions? Or are you, are you all flabbergasted with? Uh, uh, how do you handle legacy systems and the data in them? <laughs> how do you handle legacy systems? Well, actually, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, you replace them, which is part of what I do with modern systems that do stuff like this. Uh, with legacy systems, you usually work with snapshotting. So you can't do it perfectly, so you do some kind of snapshotting or data warehousing, which is not as good, but especially, I mean, most of the legacy systems I work with, they're from the last millennium, I should say, they're from before the 2000s, so they're quite old. Um, snapshotting, but basically you need to replace them. And actually, even some legacy systems have this sort of thing, not to this extent, have it built in. Not to the extent that a judge can roll back 30 years of, of things. But some legacy systems that were developed in the 90s actually have the basis of this in them already. So do we keep the data in, in, in this way or, um, or do, we, do we aggregate it? Um, well, it's official register. So yes, we keep, we, we keep the data in this form. Uh, but uh, we also are working on something called uh, something CQRS or event streaming to stream this to other systems uh, to make it uh, uh, easier to search. Because you can imagine having this in a relational, any kind of database and searching it is difficult. Uh, so you might want to move it to, we, we have graph databases because there's relations, there's not just people, there's relations. So, so there's actually move it to different databases. But if you want to have the truth, you need to have an official document. We always go back to the, to the, the primary, the, the source of truth, the primary database like this and get the data from there because any derivative, any copy you make might contain errors. And again, we're talking about things decisions that be quite impactful if you make the wrong thing. So yes, for searching purposes, uh, uh, we do have, we, you can make copies in different systems in Mongo, we have uh, a Neo4j for graph searches, uh, Cassandra, or just a different database with a different layout. Just, just uh, put it into Kafka, all these things. Uh, but for consistency reasons, if you want to have a visual document, we always go back to the, to the in this case, relational database. Any more? How do you handle changes in regul regulatory requirement that you aren't allowed to store all data anymore? Yeah, so, uh, so how do we... Um, 
deal with regulatory changes like, like privacy impact. Uh, the nice thing of working for a government is that they're usually excluded from these privacy regulations because in order to qualify you for the GDPR, you need to have like some grounds based on what your data. And one of those grounds is actually, if it's written in the law that you need to do this as a government organization, then you're allowed to. So that takes care of that. However, regulations change, sometimes very soon. So that's, uh, uh, that's a, a, a challenge. So basically, if there is a new law, usually you need a new IT system as well. So whenever there is a new law, and hopefully you have enough uh, time in advance before you can build the system, otherwise you might be lagging behind. So what they usually do, at least in the Netherlands, in the law, they include like the start date when, when the law applies, depends on when the system is ready. That's a nice law. So the law only starts applying once your system, not everyone's system, but the system is ready. Uh, so that gives you a couple of years usually to, to figure this sort of thing out. But yeah, it's uh, so basically if there's regulatory change, you might need to redesign the system and migrate all the data, including all the history from the old mall into the new one, which is uh, yeah, part of what I do actually. Any more questions? Thank you very much and have a very nice day.